now. So I'm going to just hand over the mic shortly to Lisa, who's going to moderate this panel session. She's then going to be joined by Joel from the Trade Desk, Matt from Index Exchange, Laura, who's the Head of Sustainability at Essence, and then Phil Acton, who is from Adform. Hopefully everybody's now slowly joining the session. I can see Lisa's there. Hi, Lisa. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Uh, good, good. I think we're just gradually letting everyone connect. So I will hand the mic over to you. And as always, if anyone does have any questions for our panelists, please do add them to the Q&A box and we'll try as get, and get to as many of them as we can. Lisa, I'll hand over to you. Thanks so much, Lauren. So thank you. Thanks everyone for joining today. This is gonna be a great discussion about sustainability and what it means for the ecosystem. I'm actually gonna suggest that instead of having everyone on the panel introduce themselves, I have the question of the day that we're gonna start with, and then I will pass this over to Laura. So I think Daniel highlighted some of the key sustainability issues within the supply chain. What do you guys think the biggest problem is and where do we start? So Laura, over to you. Hello, I'm Laura from Essence, and I am, for disclosure, a head of sustainability and not a programmatic expert. <laughs> so I'm just going to caveat that here now. I think in terms of our biggest challenge, I think Daniel's highlighted it really, isn't it? It's the complexity of it all, and it is the lack of transparency. I also feel it's probably a mindset shift as well, because I think previous, previous initiatives such as brand safety has, has seen publishers feel like they have taken the full weight of the sort of commercial impact of those sort of initiatives. So it's making sure supply chain transparency is about collaborating with your supply chain and working together to identify how everyone can create value out of a new supply chain and create new principles and work towards that. It's not about one party in the supply chain dictating a set of principles and rules. And I think that's probably the biggest challenge that we have because we do need to come together and collaborate. We do need to have a level of trust of why we're all collaborating. And fundamentally, we need to all galvanize around a consistent methodology in terms of measurement. So I feel like I've said a lot of challenges rather than one big challenge, but I think they all end up being the same challenge in the sense of we, we need to probably change the way that we all work together uh, and start from a base of collaboration and aligning on what we are trying to achieve, which, are, which ultimately is decarbonization, because for advertising to have a role in a net zero society, we need to make sure that we are fit for purpose and we're not wasting the energy that is so valuable a resource. Definitely. I love the idea of collaboration. Joel, over to you. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Hi, everyone. I am Joel. I am the Senior Director of Partnerships for the Trade Desk, so looking after our SSP and publisher relationships and that is the ones Laura says we should be collaborating with. See, so yeah, I completely agree with what Laura said and what Daniel said before, that complexity, from my perspective and in my role, the complexity of the supply chain is the big challenge to tackle. I perhaps slightly disagree with Laura, but it's very slight. I don't think we're going to have a fight about it. The, I think different entities, not one entity, should set the rules, but someone needs to initiate the rule setting at least. And we have certain rules. We won't buy one SSP via another SSP with whom we're integrated. And that is for the direct benefit of our clients because you're not paying for an additional hop. There isn't an additional party taking a fee, but it also that supply chain transparency and the efficiency of the supply chain, the optimization of it should reduce carbon emissions. And I think that sort of situation, the, the double-edged sword of it is, or double-edged benefit of it, is at the core of how I personally view we should approach this, is that, yes, obviously getting to a carbon neutral position as an industry is absolutely key, but, and speaking to my wife who actually works in the sustainability field, you have to give other benefits to people. An individual might be altruistic and might choose to do the right things, but many corporations, many investors need to see the carbon benefit and the financial benefit for them. So if we can tackle both at the same time, we'll get more people's attention and we'll make change much faster as well, I would imagine. Definitely. Matt, over to you. Hey guys, great to be here today. My name is Matt Barish. I lead the Americas at Index Exchange as well as our global publishing business. And I'm joining you today from London where it's a beautiful day and excited to be here. I think you guys touched upon a million different points, probably all of which I would have checked the box on mentioning 
had sequence been different here. But I think really the advertising business has always been about art and science. And this is the redefinition of science in some degree, in some respects. And so when you think about the advertising business today relative to where it was probably when we all began, it's really complicated. It's really complicated. And the recurrent theme that I'm hearing here is how do we simplify that, right? How do we get back to an industry that is perhaps more value-driven, less, less influenced by a number of parties that perhaps are there to make a buck rather than influence change. And change can be an industry level. Change can be because it's driving the economics of the industry. Change can be because it's driving practice and standards. And I think that comes back to when it comes to sustainability, what does it all mean? This is a nascent concept. This is something that two or three years ago probably was foreign to most of us. And I think today, when you look at a global level, and I live in the US, I'm sitting in Europe, I run a global business, I think there's a, there's a real need for education. And so who actually begins that process? I think you've seen, I'll bring up his name for the first time, Brian O'Kelly, right? One of the most polarizing figures in this space. He goes from being a ruthless CEO to a virtuous CEO. And all of a sudden this becomes a really relevant conversation. And when you think about what that means, I think sitting in Europe today, this is a really relevant conversation. And in certain, as you start to dive deeper in certain regions within the continent, it becomes a more relevant conversation. And so it's a right now conversation. And we all know it's a right conversation. But I think the real big challenge here is all around the world, it's a what's that conversation. And so how do we define what that means? And once we do that, we start the ball rolling. Thanks so much. Phil, over to you. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Phil Acton from Adform, and not PwC, as it said on the uh, on the opening slide. But delighted to be with everybody. And uh, I don't know if I'm going last, but it's always a bit of a challenge with what everybody's said. I think in terms of how I can add to that, I think in terms of what we need to tackle first in fraud, viewability, the way to add creative, and so on. I think it's all of those, and it comes down to trust. And I think again, continuing on that theme of, of education, because I think if you look across the whole of Europe, there's a nation that's local to the market or whether it's coming from the EU that's really trying to put blocks on advertising as a whole, as though we're, a, we're an industry that doesn't really add value. And I think that Daniel did a great job before taking us through a load of data, but actually a couple of days ago, he did a podcast on this with James Chandler in the UK, where he said some of the pressure coming from the EU Commission was for online to say stop using targeted advertising, where that it was a full-on strategy. Yet in other sectors, the EU is actively promoting personalization as a sort of a holy grail of offline and, and or content strategy. So for me, targeted advertising and personalized advertising are the same except for the wording. And it's perhaps because the government are under pressure from, from lobbyists and consumers who are, who are at, the, at the end of the day are those that use the internet. I think we need to always not only educate ourselves, but as Tanya from Show Hero said at the start of the webinars, we need to educate more people. We need to explain to them why we're trying to clean up the supply chain, educate the consumers as we go. Then naturally things like fraudulent impressions, using proper viewability metrics, ensuring as much spend goes from brand to publishers as possible, choosing the most routes. And of course, the environmental impact of that because we're reducing ad wastage so preventing lots of heavy bad for the environment banners i think that's the kind of thing that the average internet user wants to see and wants to hear about so i think it's great that we talk about these initiatives and people talk about brian o'kelly and so on but we need to educate everybody outside of our industry as to what we're doing and why we're cleaning it up and i actually think that will have a knock-on effect from some of the pressure we get with regards to legislation definitely Thanks so much, Phil. What does sustainability in the supply chain actually mean? And how do we think we can achieve this? Joel, I'll start with you. So I think sustainability in the supply chain just means understanding the environmental impact, first of all, of every single decision. And that goes from the people buying the ads, the planning at the beginning, all the way through to the end user seeing an ad on their TV, laptop, phone, or even an out of home billboard. It's not easy. And I know we'll come on to talk about that later, um, but you need to look to solve 
all of that and that's obviously sounds like an absolute nightmare it's a, i think the approach just has to be systematic and pragmatic you just it's like when i have two young kids when i have to tidy a room i walk into the room and feel like i'm going to cry but you just have to start at one end and work your way through to the other end and that's what we've got to do as an industry we have we have as not just an industry but as an entire global population been behaving like little kids and just chucking our mess around everywhere and not thinking about the consequences of our actions and so I should caveat that I love my kids but I just hate tidying up after them and that is what we need to do as an industry you've got to optimize the existing processes we have we've got to ensure that everything we do uh, works in the most efficient way that it can do but also look to the future and even if you can't make it as efficient as you want to now what can you do in six nine twelve months or even five years and ultimately you, you have to start now and that means we've rolled out open path recently as a, a direct to publisher integration solution that is one option of going direct to the publisher removing some of the data processing but to daniel's point direct isn't always the best method it won't necessarily always be the most efficient and you've got to look at the paths you take i'm sure there is a worst option and there are worse options but you need to strip things down to the best options and i think everybody has a responsibility to do it it doesn't have to come from the advertiser it doesn't have to come from the user i think daniel said daniel had a really excellent slide showing how many ssps the average publisher works with and the incremental benefit once they got outside the sort of top 20 was negligible. And I'm certain the same works for advertisers as well. I'm not just hitting on the DSP, on the SSPs, DSPs too. There are plenty of us in the industry and it's important for absolutely ev everyone to look at their partners, look at their path, look at what's next in line after them and what comes before them and try and optimize and improve that and make it much more efficient as possible. Thanks, Joel. Matt, over to you. Yeah, I think you have to follow the money here. And it all begins with the marketer in my mind. And the marketer dictates. And so when you look at the evolution of the industry, you look at some of the problems that we've solved over the past decade or so. I'll take viewability as a great example. I think there were CMOs who stood up and said, hey, it's come to my attention that I'm buying inventory that's not viewable, or I'm buying fraudulent inventory. How do we start to clean up a very murky gray area? And so when I look at where this begins and I think about it, and I look at the statements that major companies make, CMOs make, which are virtuous, right? And they speak to the consumer and they say, hey, we are committed to being carbon free or whatnot. All of a sudden the agency jumps and goes, hey, we support that too, because that's going to help us to retain the client. But are they doing it because it retains the client or are they doing it for the proper purpose? And that trickles down the line. And so when you start to think about following the dollar, there's that level of accountability. There's that level of partnership rather than vendorship that I think you have to think about in a world where, you know, whether it's Joel, whether it's Philip, we have to be fully transparent to one another in terms of how we best activate and how we best clean this up. And so whether that's driving efficiency in terms of how we bid on, on, on programmatic media, and I think there's a level of cost effectiveness there, which is where this began. And now that evolution goes towards how do we make the world a better place? Because there's just a ton of waste there. And so, yes. It becomes cheaper, but yes, the future becomes brighter. I think you have to start to think about this holistically. And what does it mean and how do we get there? Well, I think it begins with trade organizations like the IAB stepping up and herding cats and getting the buy side and the sell side and everyone in between to align on some type of definition. And then the next iteration or the next step of that is there are companies that are popping up, I think which are, they're, they're well-intentioned, but they're for profit. And this is ironic, right? Because again, I get that we're running businesses, but the question, is this a huge TAM and a huge opportunity, or is this being motivated by the proper opportunity to do right? And so I'll leave that there and I'll, I'll let you guys think about that and what it means. Thanks, Matt. Couldn't agree more. Phil, over to you. 
Yeah, I love that. I love that last comment about the uh, them being commercial companies that, we, but we all seem to want to work with them. I think I don't want to turn this into a into an identity conversation because obviously we're talking about supply path optimization. But I think actually we find quite often at Adform the two go hand in hand because here we are trying to clean up the supply path by having uh, as fewer hops as possible from the DSP to the, or from the advertiser to the publisher. But actually, I think in terms of sustainability in the supply chain, I think one area of it is finding a solution to the third party cookie is a way of building sustainability because we can't just wait for Google to kill this off. We've got to actively realize as an industry that if we find a viable solution, this is right for the consumer, it, it's right for the advertisers, and it's also right for the publishers which I think can only be a, a good thing. And I think without a viable solution, then the ad industry probably outside of the wall gardens will, will be fairly unsustainable. So I think that's been a big focus for us is as we've, uh, at Tadform, as we've tried to clean up and look at supply path optimization and we're, we're in a good position because we have both buy and sell side pipes. We've also understood that actually having those integrations into the publishers uh, and allowing them to send us things like first party data, first party IDs has also had a commercial benefit. And I think for something to grow and take legs, it has to have that as well. But I think it, it benefits the user and the consumer because it's a much more ethical way of approaching it. The publishers, for them, it's almost like a golden age of publishing again, because what they have, their data has become really worth something. And as Tim said at the very start of this morning, he said, I think it was 80% of brands said buying quality media and being willing to pay a premium for it was key to them. So all of a sudden we have a benefit of supply path optimization and cleaning up that supply chain is we come back with a model that's really good for consumers because they their data is used in an ethical way. It's really good for advertisers because they're able to use first party data and, and, and first party IDs and also use that across things like Safari as well. But it's also good for the industry because it means we will have an open internet advertising business come whenever it is that Google decides to kill off the cookie on Chrome. So I think that's a big part and the two do definitely go hand in hand. Thanks, Phil. Laura, I know that at the start of this, you said you're the sustainability expert, not the programmatic expert. How do you think that we as an industry are tackling some of the issues that the guys raised and have you actually seen any best practices? I think not to be controversial, but I'm okay with new people entering the industry with new tools and technology and making a profit from it because sustainability is about creating a thriving economy and society for all now and forever. And actually, I think it's more for the rest of the industry that we were so behind the curve that we weren't thinking about this and bringing out our own initiatives. So I think as an industry, we're behind versus other sectors, which probably is why the trust issue is not there as well with consumers, because we need to get our own house in order. And I also feel in terms of what best practice looks like, I think it's about having verified commitments. So just as WPP have committed to science-based targets and having net zero media plans by 2030, that is a requirement that's going to cascade down the supply chain because we cannot achieve that without having all of our suppliers and partners aligned with net zero. And I want to be really clear that net zero is not the same as carbon neutral. Again, circling back to our point about education, I think that it, there's a few quarters that are using those terminologies interchangeably and they're not. <laughs> and again, we need to educate ourselves and bring it to the fore. I think in terms of best practice and what I've seen out there, I, we're, like, we're all, and I know this is a big cliche, but we're all at the start of this conversation. I avoid the same journey then. But I, I think, and that bringing it back to the topic that we're talking about, trust and transparency, I think we need to embrace that and be willing to admit that we're at the start of that. No one has got one silver bullet that's going to solve this for us. And actually we need to, and that's why the commitments are so important because we need to align on what our commitment is. What is our end goal? Our end goal is decarbonisation of, of the ecosystem and that definition already exists what that means is how we're going to get there and what the consequences are of that there'll be some winners and there'll be some losers it's then how do we set ourselves up to be how do people suppliers set themselves up to be the winners of that scenario i don't know if i'm answering your question now but i just <laughs> in terms of best practices i think there's interesting technology out there like glimpse in terms of addressing the amount of energy that's being generated in header bidding I think a really simple way of thinking about it is if data is energy and energy is carbon, 
identifying wasted data, wasted vanity data. So heavy creative, for example, that's going to be viewed on a mobile phone. Is that is that necessary? I think the opportunity for streaming digital formats to reduce the carbon footprint is an easy win that we can all imp implement now. And yeah, just being able to, for me, it, it is using scope three at the moment to measure what the carbon footprint is down to the impression level and see what's driving those emissions. Wasteful ad tech, old code that's sitting on domains. All of these are, it, it's all of these are best practice in terms of efficiency as well. It's, it's, it's really about operational efficiency for everyone that's in the supply chain at the moment, for me would be best practice as a baseline and then we can move forward in what reduction really looks like. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Laura, for that. So I know you talked about a bit on the measurement of the impact our ecosystem has on the climate, but let's talk about an even bigger question of how does that work and who funds it? Joel, I'll start with you. Yeah, I'm happy, happy to start here. So I think it's the funding part is challenging. There's a lot of big companies who can afford to fund it themselves. But it, our industry is built on startups. Even Google and Facebook were startups within, I'm going to take a risk here and say, the professional memory of everyone on this call. And we, we can rely on Google, Facebook and Trade Desk and the big agency groups to fund it ourselves. But ultimately, we are really the ones generating it. So we should be funding it anyway. I think it, it needs to become an inherent cost of business that you have to do this because it's, it's just it's what we do. We are all generating significant amounts of emissions. So we have to be responsible for that in our own way. And I, I know I mentioned my wife earlier to be quite frankly, you should probably have her here instead of me, but she worked on a recent government initiative. She was seconded to the department of work and pensions, and they implemented something called the TCFD, not to be confused with TCF, which is the task force on climate related financial disclosures. So that is now a part of law that large financial institutions are obliged to participate in this and they have to create a report on their business's exposure to climate change, how they are contributing to climate change and how they're going to manage it, how they plan to fix it in the future and have an actual action plan, which is something Laura mentioned. And we've got ad net zero for our industry. And again, showing it to my wife, who is really the sustainability expert. She was actually really quite impressed by it because it is quite a clear action plan. You know, it starts, what's the impact of the ads you run? on in terms of carbon emissions and it goes all the way down to the events you run and the travel you do as a business and everything in between it's not just a token gesture it is actually a, a, an important and thought out action plan and i think those there is a, an argument that governments need to and probably over time will make that a legal compulsion as they have with tcfd for the finance industry we will all have to do this at some point so we may as well get ahead of it now. It's like the old uh, planting a tree analogy is the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. And the second best time is now. So we all need to plant that tree now all become part of ad net zero. And even look at the, there's the re 100, which is a movement for businesses to become based on 100% renewable electricity or renewable energy. And there's things like TCFD, have a look at it, see what you can do, see if it, it's relevant to your business. You might not need to want to disclose anything yet, but major investors are looking at the sort of green initiatives, the renewable initiatives, the carbon neutral or otherwise beneficial and sustainable approaches of businesses. So it's actually going to benefit you financially. And to the point Laura made, it's fine for businesses to make money out of sustainability because ultimately that's going to get more people's attention you can do the right thing but if you can do the right thing and make investors money even better they'll move faster in your direction thanks joel laura back to you on what are your thoughts on what changes can we do what are the small things how do we crawl before we run that can make an impact on tomorrow yeah, I suppose I, I come from this as an agency point of view, as an agency and a bit like Joel said at the top of this conversation, we already have sort of principles that we put in place in terms of efficiencies. I think, again, the, the team like Matt Mack, who's our SVP of product, already has done the supply path optimization so that we have a much smaller pool of SSPs that we deal with. And that, you know, I think... Yes, it is over, oversimplified, but having a shorter supply chain at this moment is a better option for us. So, for example, stripping out sort of uh, networks, etc., because they add a level of opaqueness. 
they have a level, level of margin, etc., within the, the ecosystem. Just thinking about the supply path that you're buying into, and it, and, and that is sustainable, but also in terms of transparency is vital. I think thinking about how your creative is running, like I said, thinking about how you're delivering that creative streaming versus the traditional downloads and just ensuring that you've got some best practices in place. Turn your campaign off when you hit your KPIs. Don't just leave it running. Like, as an agency, there's some really basic best practices that, again, coming back to what is waste and what is vanity and ensuring that you're hitting your KPIs as efficiently as possibly as possible is what we should be doing now. And for me, I think the focus over the next six months has to be measurement. We, everyone needs to know what their carbon footprint is of their business and have an understanding of that and where that is being driven as well. Is it your travel? Is it your offices? If you're understanding where your biggest carbon hotspots are, is critical. Is that, is that? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think um, from, from a trade desk perspective, like we've seen my, my colleague Ben started a group called We Sustain within the trade desk. And it's, you have to start things sometimes at, at grassroots and push for leadership to do things. We didn't have to push. They already had things in work, thankfully, but you need people in the business to be engaged. It can't just come from the top and the measurement side of things that Laura's mentioned is absolutely key, but also just getting people engaged on, on a more personal level. We went out as a group and did a litter pick along the Thames and things, and it's not going to make a vast difference, but it just gets people engaged, gets a group together. It's a bonding activity that's perhaps more of a gesture than making a real impact, but it gets us together as a team and gets everyone thinking about the subject. And while we're doing it, we're talking about things like ad net zero and how we can measure it as a business. We're really brainstorming about the subject and leadership heavily engaged, I'm sure, in all of our businesses in this, but we all need to push at different levels and think about this at different levels and contribute at different levels because that's how you make change happen. Definitely. Matt, I think you were going to comment as well. No, it's so funny, Jill, you mentioned your wife and how she works in this space. My wife runs human resources for one of the holding companies. And when I said to her, I'll be doing a panel on sustainability, she said, oh, we do all of these programs like the ones you just mentioned. And I think when I think about the term, it's so broad. And I think that's perhaps a beauty and perhaps a curse, right? Perhaps I think finding definition here becomes challenging, right? And, you know, we're, we're in a moment in time where there's very clearly been a roller coaster of a year in 22, right? Our priorities have all been shifting constantly. You start to look at the macroeconomic climate here, the war, supply chain shortages, and you start to say, hey, like, I'm going to shuffle the deck in terms of priorities. I think one thing to be really cognizant of here is how does this not de get be become deprioritized, right? Where we talk about the businesses we run, and we all run big businesses. I think we can't neglect that. And we want to continue to run them, but we also want to change the way that we do so. And so in thinking about that, how do you build this into the strategy? not neglect it because it's one of those things that you kick the can down the road and you think about, hey, like we've got to hit numbers for the next 90 days and we're going to be laser focused on that. But you have to really start to think about the right now and, and really build that into the priority set and the planning part and not just go, hey, when I think about supply chain and I think about the term efficiency and I think about the cost and QPS and the conversation that Joel and I had once upon a time, as, as partners. And now I think that context changes and shifts away from the economics of QPS efficiency back towards environmental sustainability. What is the additional cost that is incurred there? Or how do we start to think about that and drive that as a collaborative conversation? So we're both aligned that if it costs a little bit more, the end goal is actually worth it. Thanks, Matt. So, Phil, did you want to yeah, I was just going to go back to, I think the original question, which was about what small changes can we make? I think, I think Joel talks about doing the, the, the lit, picking up the litter is almost like a token gesture, but I think those, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. So do, starting now and doing something now as individuals, this is great that we're sitting around debating it, but making sure that we then go away and we do something and we're not just paying lip service to it is really important. And I think as a large business, but with a, an office of say around 30 in the UK, we can do the same. We can ensure our 
office is a little bit more environmentally friendly, that we do the right level of recycling, that we don't leave lights on overnight and, and air conditioning and so on. But we can also put pressure on our business to look at what they can do as a, a, almost as quick wins, I think. So according to AdNet Zero, the two biggest co corporates in the UK of carbon dioxide emissions are 60% travel, I think, of which 60% of that is flights and then 40% energy. So instantly we can make a difference there. We, we've ensured in Europe, at least our data centers are run on 100% renewable energy. From a travel perspective, we all work for tech companies. I've worked for US tech companies before where we fly across the pond a lot. But I think with a lot of offices in Europe, we have around 20 in Europe. There's a lot of, or there was previously a lot of short travel, short haul travel that we did that were flights that we're now saying we're coming out of a pandemic or we've come out of pandemic. Of course, everyone wants to get on a plane rather than do another Zoom call. But actually let's look at, can we get the train instead of fly? Do we really need to go? Can we combine it one trip instead of three trips? These are things that we can do now to move the dial. And I think that's, that's really important. I think what's missing from our side, and again, we're at the start of the conversation is that measurement. And I think working with, working with AdNet Zero to do, to use them, to help us do that measurement of what our office is, is going to be a big part to have a big role to play. Thanks, Phil. Definitely. So last question for everyone, optimism or despair, Phil? Yeah. I will let you start with that. I think if you wake up every morning and your biggest competitor is Google, you have to be an optimist to get through the day. But I think, I think it, let's start with the wins. I think it, as an industry, looking at sustainability in the supply path, looking at supply path optimization for the commercial benefits. And of course, there's, there's kind of economic benefits as well off the back of that. But also I think everybody that's on this call probably works with IAB with regards to things like gold standards. So we, there are sub levels within that. That means we really adhere to trying to be transparent and to deliver the best possible experience for consumers. I think that's a big tick. And I think a part of that, as I've said before, is that we also probably have something that's a good solution for the death of the cookie. I think, which means we have a sustainable business in a few years outside of the World Gardens. I think in terms of the carbon neutral neutrality, it sounds like we are all at different stages, but I think, I think as Laura has said, as long as we've got someone senior that's with us in our organization, that's willing to, it's got the buy-in and willing to see this as something for investors, something for, I think I've seen more and more RFPs or RFIs land where people are asking this as not just item 10 out of 10, but actually three or four. And also in terms of hiring people, in terms of hiring younger people from more diverse backgrounds into the industry, this is something that they deeply care about. And I think we have to, we have to start now and we have to get better at it, but at least let's start now. Thanks, Phil. Matt, over to you, short and sweet, because I think we only have a minute left. If I answer despair, then they're going to make me swim home back to New York. So the answer very clearly is optimism. I think I can't say that I'm optimistic across the industry. And personally, I'm optimistic, but I think there are going to be some tough times ahead for some companies that perhaps may not understand what this all means and the bigger picture, how this fits into their future with the partners who value this differently. So I think for now, personally, super optimistic, and I think we are just getting started. And so there's a long way to go, but if we're all collaborative and we're all aligned here, then I think we can get there. Yeah. Joel? You won't um, have to swim home, at least. No, thanks, Bill. I live south of the river, so a little swim. But yeah, optimism as well. Bid duplication removal and the efficiencies of SPO as our industry, a huge step. But also, I think everyone on this call is that their businesses are a member of AdNet Zero, which is huge and probably has changed in the last year. You've got the emergence of companies like Goodloop and Scope3, and they're all pushing us to go in the right direction. And, and something Phil said is true here as well. We see a number of advertisers who are looking at pointing their budgets at either sites that promote sustainability as a subject or and or sites that are run sustainably. And that wasn't happening two years ago. And I think these are all really important steps as, as well as everything everyone else has said. I think we're all going in the right direction. Thanks, Phil. Laura? I'm going to steal an environmentalist Joanna Macy's definition, active hope. And I think the reason it has to be active hope is that we all need to play our part. We can't sit on our laurels and hope that this is going to get sorted. We've all got to lean in and be active in this space and champion it. The small things to the big things. We need radical transformation within the next 24 months if we want to stay on target for a net zero society, which we desperately need to do. Yeah, active hope. Yeah. I like that active hope. Thank you guys so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Lauren, I'm going to hand it back over to you. 